One of the Pali terms for meditation is jitta bhavana, the development of the jitta. And we usually translate jitta as mind. That gives one sense of what the word means, but it's only one sense. Because the word jitta can also mean heart when we talk about a jitta of metta, metta jitena. It's not just thinking thoughts of goodwill, it's feeling thoughts of goodwill, and willing thoughts of goodwill. So what we're training here is not just the mind up in the brain, but it also goes down into the heart. Now the heart has two main functions. One is feeling, emotions, and the other is willing to act, and the two are very closely connected. With certain emotions you don't feel any energy to act at all. With others you feel very strongly an energy to act. And the question is, will your actions be skillful or not? This is why the heart needs to be trained as much as the mind. Trained in how to feel, trained in how to will. And the Buddha gives lots of training in this direction. Those five reflections we had just now. They're not just to think about, but they're also for you to contemplate what's really worth doing. On the one hand, there's a lot of change. Subject to aging, illness, and death, separation from all that we love. The question is, what are you going to do about change? Some people will tell you that the Buddha teaches you, well, you simply have to accept it because that's all there is. Things are keep, keep on changing and changing and changing. And if you resist change or if you try to find something that doesn't change, you're going against the nature of reality. But the Buddha did teach that there's something that doesn't change. And it can be attained through our efforts. So what's worth willing then? Simple acceptance? Well, no. It's worth willing to act in ways that will lead to that changeless dimension. That's why the contemplation ends with, I'm the owner of my actions. Whatever I do, for good or for evil, to that will I fall there. Your actions will make, the will make a difference. So I want to make sure that you are well motivated to act, well motivated to act skillfully. This is where the emotions come in. They're not just a matter of how you feel about somebody doing something or someone saying something or events outside. It's not just your passive reaction to things. It's your active sense of what can be done. There's a certain amount of emotion that goes into that, too. You see this very clearly with people who are depressed. They have no desire to act. They feel that everything is hopeless. Their actions will not make a difference. And so they just give up. And it's a very bad state of mind to be in, just in terms of the feeling side. And it's very strongly related to the fact they don't feel that anything is worth doing, nothing is worth willing. But as the Buddha said, the end of suffering is possible. It is possible to find something that doesn't change. This is why I'm going to explain the different emotions that we are subject to. You pointed out how we normally deal with undesirable change, with sadness and sorrow, what he calls household sorrow or household grief, and our usual reaction is to try to go for household pleasure, household joy. In other words, disappointed in things that change, people change, situations change. And so we look for more people and more situations to depend on. But of course, that's setting us up for a fall. That's why he says the cure for household of grief is renunciate grief. Realization that there are people who have attained true awakening. That's the hope. The grief part of that, though, is that you're not there yet. But still, it's grief with a purpose, grief with an end in sight. If you learn how to master the path, you, you too can find the way there.
And then he says, replace renunciate grief with renunciate joy, which is the joy that comes from contemplating things and realizing that there's something much better than what you've been looking for, and you've attained it. Renunciate equanimity. When you've, when you've attained that, then you can look at the rest of the world with a lot more equanimity. It's a very different kind of equanimity, the equanimity that many people will counsel when they say, well, learn how to accept things, just stops right there. You have to force yourself not to want anything more. You're lowering your sights, which is certainly not what the Buddha would have you do. He would have you raise your sights, find the deathless, and then you can look back at the world. And the equanimity there comes from knowing that no matter how much things are going to change in the world, what you found is not going to be affected by that. That's where the Buddha is pointing us, in training the heart and training the mind. Learn how to think in a way that excites the emotions that will want to act toward that goal, realizing that it is a possibility. So remember, you're not just training the brain here, not just training the way you think. You're training the way you will, the way you feel. And all these things go together, which is why they use the one word, citta, for heart and mind. Because from the Buddhist point of view, that the division, our division between heart and mind would be artificial. The way we think is going to have an impact on how we feel and what we'd want to do. And how we feel and what we want to do is going to have an impact on the way we think. In other words, our desires have their reasons, our reasons have, have their desires. And you want to remember that you're going to be training both sides, and training them in such a way that you can find the heart's true desire, which is for it, a happiness that doesn't change, happiness that doesn't let you down. Because we've seen so much of the changes in the world. we realized the only way the heart is going to find any true peace is to find a happiness that's not going to change on you. And the Buddha's good news is that there is such a happiness that does exist. So as you think in terms of grief about the way the world is changing, and you look around you and the world at large, it's pretty discouraging. But we have to remember that each of us is creating his or her own world. And it is possible through your actions to create a world in which the deathless is possible. You're creating a new you, you're creating a new world. The two go together, you'll be going beyond them at some point. But this is what the training is for. So even though there's some grief in the realization that you're not there yet, it's grief with hope, which is the opposite of depression. That's grief with no hope at all, which is basically what this teaching on learning how to accept everything and just be okay with the fact that everything changes and just stay right there. That's pretty hopeless. Take the Buddha's alternative, which is that it is possible to find something that doesn't change, and it's going to be a happiness that doesn't change. And trust him when he says that it's really worth whatever effort goes into it. So whenever we have that reflection on aging, illness, death, separation, and karma, Remember, it's there to train your heart. Say, so remember that even though the world has full of aging, illness, and death, and separation, there's something else. 
and that something else can be found through your own efforts. Let that inspire your heart. <laughs>